Hi, my name is Hannah Atkinson and I work with Santa Barbara Audubon Society. We're a local nonprofit that protects birds and bird habitat, and we try to connect people to nature through education, conservation, and science. Today, we're really happy to partner with Santa Barbara Public Library to bring you this video. Now, there are a lot of different Audubon Society chapters all over the country, but the local Santa Barbara chapter is really unique. We have a program called Eyes in the Sky with over 40 dedicated volunteers and several ambassador birds. Now, each of these bird species uh, is a species you can see locally, whether that's in your backyard or out on hikes at places like Lake Los Carneros in Goleta. All of our birds are disabled in some way and wouldn't be able to survive on their own in the wild. For example, Fuku here is blind. You can see that she has an unusual look to her eyes and she constantly moves her head as she listens to the things around her. Because Fuku wouldn't be able to survive on her own in the wild, she wouldn't be able to catch her own food. We take care of her and now she goes and meets people as an ambassador. Now at Eyes in the Sky, we have ambassador birds, including a hawk, two falcons, and three different kinds of owl. Even though these are all different kinds of birds, they're all called raptors or birds of prey. Puku specifically is a western screech owl, one of the smallest owl species in North America. Funnily enough, western screech owls don't actually screech. Instead, they make a very soft burbling sound. They have incredible hearing and they usually have incredible eyesight at night. Now, Puku caught an eye infection when she was out in the wild. That's how she lost her eyesight, and that's how she came to us. She knows her way around her aviary, but because she wouldn't be able to catch her own food, she's gonna spend her life as an ambassador. All right, I'd like you to meet our next raptor ambassador, Ivan. Now, I'm gonna give you a moment to guess what kind of and and I'll tell you a little bit about why these birds are so important and so magical. Human cultures have been fascinated with birds throughout history. All around the world, there are legends about birds. And here in the Santa Barbara area, this is historically the land of the Shumash native people. Birds of prey like hawks and eagles play really important roles in their stories and their traditions. Even though he's big and striking, Ivan isn't actually an eagle. He's a red-tailed hawk. It's a little hard to tell from the cream-colored underside, but the top of his tail is a rust red color, and when the sunlight shines through it, it glows a bright, fiery red. When Ivan was in the wild, he was hit by a car. Our best guess is that he was swooping across a road trying to catch prey, like a mouse or a squirrel, and he just didn't see the car coming. He's more than 20 years old, and he spent most of his life meeting the public as an ambassador for his species. This is Athena. Now, you may have heard of the Greek goddess Athena, whose symbol was an owl. Athena here is a barn owl. You can tell by the bright white colors of her feathers and the heart shape of her face. Athena is one of our most popular birds, especially with classrooms of students, because she's so incredibly beautiful. Just like the other birds at Eyes in the Sky, barn owls are a native species you can find right here in the Santa Barbara area. Um, just like most other owls, they're nocturnal, which means they only come out at night. They make a pretty unexpected sound, so if you hear a screech at night, it might be a barn owl. And just like our other birds, Athena, unfortunately, can't live in the wild anymore. She, just like some of our other birds, was hit by a car. Even though her wings are perfectly fine, she unfortunately went blind in one eye, and now she's not able to hunt and to catch prey like she would need to if she were still out in the wild. Because of that, she's here with us, and she's an ambassador bird. All right, this is the last bird I'm going to introduce you to today, and this is actually our most well-known bird. This is Max. Max is a great horned owl, which is the largest species of owl found in North America, including right here in our area. If you hear the hooting hoo hoo of an owl at night, it might be a great horned owl. Now, unlike our other birds, Max doesn't actually have a physical injury. Instead, he fell out of the nest when he was a baby. He was rescued by humans, but he imprinted on humans. That means he doesn't know the difference between humans and owls, and he doesn't have all the behaviors he would need to survive in the wild. He never learned how to hunt, and he never learned how to interact with other wild owls. But even though uh, he doesn't have all the instincts and all the skills he would need, there are some things he still instinctively knows. 
he has actually been a foster dad for over 70 baby owlets who could then be released back into the wild. Now, like I said, Max is our most well-known bird. That's because since 2001, he's been the star of our Meet Your Wild Neighbor program, which goes into local elementary schools and teaches students about birds like Max. Um, kids get to meet some of our birds, just like Max, and learn to recognize the birds in their own backyards, parks, and open spaces in our area. Now, Max and I really hope you enjoyed meeting our magical birds. Santa Barbara Audubon Society runs programs and events for kids and adults to connect with birds in our area. If you want to learn more or volunteer with us, you can find out more on our website, santabarbaraaudubon.org. If you want to read more about these magical birds and others like them, you can visit the Santa Barbara Public Library website at sbplibrary.org. Thank you. All right, so that was four of the birds that we have currently. We have five actually. We'll go through some of the sounds of some of these birds and a little bit of a more of a verbal description. The first bird that Hannah discussed was Puku, our western screech owl. Let's take a listen to what a screech owl sounds like. As Hannah was saying, screech owls don't really screech, they do something a little different. So uh, yeah, nice little burbly sound as, as Hannah was saying. I would say for Puku, imagine a little fluff ball with eyes and ear tufts. These little ear, uh, more like uh, feather tufts on, on the top of her head. Uh, almost look like little, little cat ears. She's about five inches high. And I would say her shape and size is that of a medium, say, a jar of mayonnaise, uh, just kind of like a small little con uh, contained um, uh, bird. You know, she's just kind of barrel shaped. Uh, her weight though is amazingly light. She is a third of a pound. And I would say you could compare that to a small cup of yogurt. So next time if you have a little cup of yogurt or, or cottage cheese or something like that, that's just how much she would weigh. Amazingly, for such a small bird, she has a pretty large wingspan when you think about it, if she's only about five inches high, but she has a wingspan of about 22 inches. So they can really spread out those wings. They do fly silently and um, make their way through the forest at night. Um, quite adept at getting around. So that's Puku. Ken, I'll just also discuss Ivan. Let's listen to what Ivan sounds like. Yeah, that's the classic raptor sound. It's used a lot in movies to depict an eagle totally false. It's a red-tailed hawk. Magnificent. Um, Ivan is uh, fairly large. I'd say he's around 14, 15 inches high if you're holding him on your arm. Again, the weight is amazingly light. He is two and a quarter pounds. Two to two and a quarter pounds. Uh, just think about holding a quart of milk or a quart of any kind of liquid. That's a about how much he would weigh. He looks like he would just weigh so much more, but it's, you know, a product of being able to fly, being very light. And his wingspan is around four feet. So a nice extensive uh, wingspan so that they can glide through the air pretty much effortlessly. Our next bird is Athena, the barn owl. Okay, let's take a listen to her. Ah, 
kind of un, uh, you know, uh, unworldly, uh, un earthly. She's very beautiful, and then she has this amazing uh, eerie sound in the night. So she's the one, if you hear a screeching sound, um, it might be that barn owl out there. Uh, think of her as kind of like an elongated fluff ball. She's about, oh, about uh, 12 inches high. She's sitting on your arm. Again, very lightweight. Uh, she's only uh, one and a half pounds. So she's a little over like a pint of milk. Um, her wingspan is around three and a half feet. Max, our great horned owl. Actually, this next clip is of two owls doing a duet. You will hear the female first, and then you'll hear the male pipe in. You know, the, the second uh, hooting is very much what Max sounds like. Let's take a listen. So that is the sound of a great horned owl. Um, again, as Hannah has mentioned, all of the birds that we have are native to the Santa Barbara area. Chances are uh, we, you might be hearing these out there. Uh, imagine Max is, uh, well, he's like a giant puku. He's about three times the size of puku. Yeah, so again, he's, he's around 14, 15 inches high, but he only weighs uh, two and a quarter pounds, like Ivan. Uh, his, similar, his weight is similar to that, say, of a quart of milk. Um, his wingspan is more like five feet. I mean, massive wingspan. Um, I kind of measured it against myself. I'm five foot four. I stretch out my arms, and my arms are about five feet. And <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Uh, Max is just, uh, you know, uh, small, but with this amazing wingspan. One bird that uh, was not in the video is uh, Kanadi. And Kanadi is our American kestrel. Uh, he's in the falcon family. The American kestrel is the, the smallest falcon we have in North America. So Kanadi's small like Puku, but he's, he's more sleek like you would see in a songbird. His weight, he's a quarter pound. He's like a quarter pounder. Um, imagine if you're holding up just one stick of butter. Uh, that's a quarter pound. That's that's Kanadi. Uh, let's take a listen to him. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear this kind of sound, say near open fields um, where they'll be hunting. Uh, so at this point. I'll turn this back over to Hannah and um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, our mystery bird guests. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Hannah. Um, I do have a very special guest with me today. Connie, should I bring him out now? Yes. All right. Well, give me just one moment. I'm going to reach behind me to this perch I have. And get this guy to step up on my hand. So what I have with me now is Bones, the Harris's hawk. So Bones is not one of our eyes in the sky birds. The eyes in the sky birds all came to us from the wild and each of them has a disability that means they can't be released back to the wild. Uh, Bones is very different. So in addition to the work I do with Eyes in the Sky, I'm also separately licensed as a falconer, which means I work with birds that are rescued from the wild that can be released back to the wild. I also work with some birds that were bred in captivity. And Bones is one of those birds. He's a Harris's hawk, so he's a medium-sized hawk. He has dark brown feathers. And because he's a juvenile in his first year, he's about nine months old, he also has pale blonde streaks. 
feathers, especially on his chest, and he has reddish brown shoulders. As he gets older, he's going to lose all that streaking, but he'll keep those reddish brown shoulders. He also has some very bright yellow um, skin and scales on his face and on his legs. Now, Bones came from a captive breeding project because he has always been meant to be a falconry bird. He's going to be a working bird, so he's actually being trained to scare away other pest birds. He's likely to be working at Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara and a few other places, keeping away pigeons, crows, seagulls, maybe even starlings um, from any area that needs to keep those birds away. And so falconry, abatement falconry like that, is used a lot by um, vineyards, berry fields, um, even dumps and landfills, areas that need to keep birds away in an environmentally friendly way that isn't harming the populations of the birds, it's just deterring them from one area because their natural predator is staying in that area. So as a falconry bird, um, bones can be released off my glove and he'll fly right back to me. I wear a very sturdy leather glove when I'm handling him because he has some very long sharp talons, but because I work with him every day, he's really used to me and he'll let me hold him on the glove like I'm doing now, um, and he'll just sit very calmly. In a moment, um, Connie, do you want to try playing his call so everyone can hear what his species sounds like? We'll see if he responds to it. And you are muted right now, Connie. That, yeah. Oops. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me check that now. Oops. You know what? Hold on. Hold on. There we go. Well, Bones is looking all around. He looks very curious. I'm actually going to pull out a snack for him. I have a little piece of food here. Um, it's the wing of a quail, so you'll see some feathers. Um, and if I have this for him, we might hear his begging call because he's still young enough that he does quite a bit of begging behavior where he'll make a call very similar to what you just heard to let me know he's bored and he wants to eat. Right now I have a little piece of food in my hand and he's looking at it very intently, but he's not saying anything. He might flap his wings a bit. He wants to, oh, here you go. We can hear him whistling and thinking. What do you think, bud? I'm now hiding the food <laughs> because I don't want to reward that um, that call and get even more noise from him. The more I feed him in response to that call, the more he's going to do it. So now that he's being quiet, I'm going to give him this food and he'll gobble down that quail wing I just handed him. And um, I'll just keep him right here on my hand. He'll spread out his wings as he's eating because he wants to hide that piece of food. Uh, from any other predators that might be around. And he'll use his feet to hold on to whatever he's eating. But these birds, um, just like the other raptors we described, are, are very, very light. So he's really not a very large hawk. He only weighs about a pound and a quarter. And that is it. Still, his wingspan is pretty large. It's uh, about three and a half feet wide. He's got a, a wing spread over my shoulder out right now, and he's got his tail all fanned out as he eats his little piece of food. Um, and we'll just leave him with that for a few minutes. He'll very happily eat his quail wing. 
So I think that's all we have in terms of prepared material. If anyone would like to ask any questions, either about the eyes in the sky birds, about bones, the falconry hawk, um, or raptors in general, please go right ahead. Thank you, Hannah. So go ahead and anyone who has a question, you can unmute and just say your name first. And I'll also be checking the chat room if anyone wants to put questions in there. This is Nellie. Hi, Nellie. Hi. Um, I'd like to know um, what's the lifespan of a, a great horned owl? Lifespan. I believe it would be around 30 years if, if all goes well. Um, generally, uh, actually, Max is now, what is he? He's 22 at this point. Um, most birds, if they're captive, they will live twice as long as they might in the wild, but uh, wild birds can also live a long time. If Again, if all goes well, if there's plenty of food and, uh, you know, they're not predated, um, not hunted upon, and, and great horned owls aren't. They're kind of at the top of the food chain. So somewhere between 25 and 30 years. We have them in our um, on our property. I hear them. Awesome, awesome. So it sounds like they might be nesting there. Yeah, we did see some owlets a couple of years ago. Nice. Nice. This is Valerie. Yeah, hi. Hello, um, I wanted to uh, ask how you get uh, quail wings or other food that uh, your hawk might like? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, this bird is eating um, the, the wing of a quail. He's just gobbling it down, feathers and all, um, which is normal for hawks, owls, falcon, all raptors really will um, eat every cast up pellets just like owls do. And in terms of getting that food, uh, both bones as a falconry bird and the eyes in the sky birds, they all eat um, mice and quail that have been farm raised. They get frozen food, they don't get live food. Um, bones is an exception because he is a falconry bird, so he does also hunt his own food because he's perfectly healthy. Um, I can let him fly free and he'll catch mice in the wild and be able to feed himself. But for the eyes in the sky birds, um, that frozen food that's farm raised is their entire diet. Hi, um, this is Lauren. How is it that the disabled birds come to eyes in the skies? Like who, who captures them? Who finds them? Yeah. Well, Connie, would you like to answer that one? Uh, in every case, they are coming from what's called uh, wildlife rehabilitation facilities. So uh, it's kind of a network, not really a network, but there's all these individual uh, facilities across the country where wildlife is rescued and then um, treated and then released to the wild, if, if at all possible. Sometimes animals will come in they're so injured that they're healthy, uh, cannot be released. So education programs would have the opportunity to adopt one of these birds. So uh, in our case, we most of our birds, two of them came from uh, the Ventura Wildlife before it became the Ojai Raptor Center. I believe there was something called the Ventura Wildlife Care. Uh, one of our birds came, actually two of our birds came from Rancho Palo Verdes down in the LA area, so there was a facility there. So, um, and how those birds get to those facilities is usually through citizens. Uh, they might see a bird uh, on the road that's been hit by a car or something, um, bring it to the facility and then they, they do what they can to do uh, treatment and get that bird back out into the wild. So now that we have the internet, um, it's really pretty nice because we can actually tap all kinds of resources across the country. 
um, places that have uh, animals that cannot be released and it's kind of like well we can't let them go i mean the option might be to to put them down to euthanize them but if there is an education program that can use them that that are that is licensed then they can do that um find a home for them and see if they can adopt uh, adapt to <coughs> Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it did. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, my name is Marcia, and I have a question that I don't know if it's exactly what you're talking about, but um, when these birds are on wires or cables, not on your arm, but on a cable, how come they don't get electrocuted? Kids ask me that all the time and I never know how to answer it. Yeah, if I could answer that, actually, there are a lot of cases, and Connie, you might be able to speak to this as well, of birds being electrocuted um, by high voltage power lines. And to my understanding, it really depends on what kind of line they're landing on and where on the line they're landing. Oh. Um, some types of lines are insulated differently and are much more dangerous to birds, especially raptors that tend to fly pretty high up and try to take those perches so they can see prey moving below them. Yeah, sometimes it's also a feature of how far apart the wires are. So birds that have a long wingspan, if uh, they touch two wires at the same time, that's, that's a lot of times. <coughs> Execution. Um, if they're only on one wire, it's kind of like they're grounded on that one wire. They're not. They're not going to be harmed necessarily. It's more like when they they're touching two of them at the same time. So small birds can get oh. away with this all the time. They're they're saying. Wait a minute. Yeah. What is? Okay, that? so that's a difference. Thank you. Hi, it's Lynn. How long will it take uh, to train Bones to do the work he needs to do? Yeah, so um, with Bones, it, it really depends on the individual bird and the individual situation. So for many of the eyes in the sky birds, they were trained to do very different jobs than what Bones is going to be doing, where they're handled um, by wildlife educators every day. They're taken out on the glove, um, but they're not asked to go off leash and fly back to someone. And those birds um, came from the wild and often lived several years in the wild before they ever experienced humans. Uh, with Bones, uh, he's very separate. He's a falconry bird. Uh, and he had a very different upbringing where he still didn't encounter humans until he was several months old and old enough to be independent from his parents. But he didn't have several years in the wild um, before he encountered humans. So he has adjusted much faster to the sort of training you need to do to have a bird flying back to you. Uh, he's almost ready to, to start working and, um, you know, be in that kind of setting where he's chasing off um, pigeons or other pest birds and then coming back to me. So by this time next year, he should be doing that job. This is Valerie again. Um, where can you find ways to volunteer if you don't live in Santa Barbara? Like I live in Southern California. Um, it's a small town. It's called Hemet. So it's, um, I'm not sure how many resources they have out here compared to Santa Barbara. That's a really good question. Um, like Connie was saying about wildlife rehab centers, I think that tends to be your best bet. A lot of areas will have a wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, the example we have in Santa Barbara, we have Ojai Raptor Center and we have Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network. Um, but there tend to be different organizations for different areas. Connie, I don't know if you have any specific thoughts, but I would think wildlife rehab is, is the first thing to look up and you should be able to find information pretty readily on what there is in your area. 
Yeah, I, I don't know of any any place uh, specifically near Hemet. Uh, I would think there would be something. You just need to go online and kind of check around, see see what's the closest to that area. Um, yeah, that'd be a good way to start. <coughs> Hi, this is Liz, and I just want to say that I think if you call their, your animal shelter, they'll probably know. Um, and I know that you're in a national park or near a national park. Uh, we were driving along one time and we hit a low flying uh, hawk and we drove directly right into the National Park Ranger Station and he was happy to uh, take the bird. So. Uh, and the bird must have been hurt because he just stayed on the windshield. It, my kids were little and they were really so upset by that, you know. So I would check with the uh, local animal shelter. And the other thing I wanted to ask, it's a little, it's a little off topic, but I'm very curious to know um, if you have any magpies in your area. Where can I find magpies? Because did, did any of you see that um, that uh, movie that's called um, Penguin Bloom. Yes. Don't tell me. Well, yes. that is a wonderful movie, and I never realized that magpies are so. They're there, and this is a little bird, as you know, that fell out of his nest, Connie, and um, related only to uh, humans. And so he walked all around the house. He had a little dolly, and he was talking, and and uh, was. And, and it also addresses uh, the fact that when when uh, humans lose some physical um, ability, how they can overcome it just by checking out what the bird's up to. <laughs> it's really amazing. Yeah, that was a, that was a that was a great film. Um, what's what's the name of the movie? Yeah. Penguin, Penguin Bloom. What was the name of the movie? Pen Penguin Bloom. Bloom. Penguins <laughs> what? Well, Bloom. bloom like flowers are blooming flowers oh are blooming, penguins but bloom penguin. penguins bloom okay thank bloom. you yeah and uh because it's black and white like a penguin so the little boy mm -hmm. named it and um it's adorable the movie is lovely yeah um, i think it's on netflix uh, or apple i'm not sure what where i found yeah, it it was, on, it was on netflix i saw that a couple weeks ago yeah that was a very, very oh, perfect movie. yeah the um, grandkids would love it too. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean one's grandkids. Sorry, I can't see how how young you all are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have magpies in Santa Barbara County. We don't have magpies in the city, but they are up in the San Ynez Valley. I've seen them. Oh, we okay. actually we actually have a magpie that is endemic to that region that, and it's found nowhere else in the world. Really? And oh. re yeah, it's, oh gosh, which one is it? It's the ye yellow-billed magpie, I believe is is specific to San Ynez. And there are black-billed uh, magpies elsewhere, but we have yellow bills. And the only one, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're part of the crow family, the, the corvid family, crows and jays, and they're very, very smart. Uh, that whole family is incredibly intelligent. Well, yeah, the, we have crows here. As, as it's going into dusk, uh, the crows all gather on the lawns and the, the street, and they sashay around like there's no tomorrow. And mm -hmm. then all they all wait around for each other, and then they get to get and they all fly off to a whole bunch of eucalyptus tall eucalyptus trees a little uh, half a mile away but you can hear them they just have no there's no end to their yakking and my poor neighbor <coughs> behind us put in solar panels and I and I'm I'm saying what are those white big white spots and the next thing I see if someone's on a ladder they they have to go up and <laughs> clean this stuff off so I don't know what they're going to do about that um, excuse me. Um, oh, um, do you do you want to go, Carmen? You could ask. I can. Oh, wait. thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Carmen. Yeah, I was just checking on crows. We have. I'm in Ventura, and in our area, we have uh, quite a few crows. Not so much around where I live, although sometimes I can hear them. 
but up uh, not too far from here, and then further up from where I live, uh, my friend tells me that every afternoon a bunch of crows come from Oxnard over to their area. So I'm just wondering, uh, they have a bad name. <laughs> Can you give me something positive about crows? Well, I don't, um, I'm not sure about the crows. Of crows gathering the way they do, like you know, in the movie, the birds sort of. It's just uh, I, I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, actually, I'm actually on a flyby with crows where I live, where they they go out to the slough by UCSB every every mm -hmm. day. They do this during the winter. Mm -hmm. the, they do these big groupings and they all roost mm -hmm. during the spring and summer. They all kind of start pairing off and building nests and it's less of a thing to have such huge groups of crows. They, they, they're very social. I would say that's the really positive thing about crows. I mean, it seems like, oh my gosh, they're making noise and they're everywhere, but that they're social means that they, they have to learn skills to get along with each other and work with each other and and all that. Um, you know, it's just the sheer intelligence of crows and ravens and scrub jays and blue jays is, is amazing to me. Um, but yeah, they can seem kind of like, oh, they're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they scare me sometimes. I I do. I used to be able to go up a walk over up on Satikoy Avenue, and I'd be walking by the like a golf course, and uh, oh, they were just. And I don't know if they were upset because I was going by. I have no idea, but <clears throat> or they were protecting their their uh, their babies or something. I'm not sure what it was, but it, they really scared me. I thought they were going to come down on me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know the the pros. <clears throat> The crows have facial recognition, and um, I never saw a baby crow, and that's because they stay in the nest till they're as big as the parents. So when wow. I hear them, and they're all behind me up on the, my neighbor's roof, I go out there and say, get out of here, you guys, you're making a racket. They have facial <laughs> recognition. So <laughs> so they just ignore me, you know, and go on about their business, And uh, but uh, they do, you know, if you, if you, uh, throw a ball of something out like aluminum foil. They love to uh, take listening objects like um, uh, rings or any kind of shiny thing. And they, I don't know where, they must bring them to their nest or something because you don't want to drop any rings or anything of value like your keys because they might just, they'll make off with it. And then, uh, and then it <laughs> yeah, call you the keys. They don't want you to be bothering them, forget it. <laughs> Do they chase away other birds, crows? Yes. Uh, you know and, what? And yeah. I there's we have um a fireplace, uh, a chimney, and they the if a seagull comes by or what's that morning dove? The morning dove likes to sit up on the screen above the chimney and goes hoo hoo, whatever, you know, that noise they make. And then um the crows start in and they're all then the then the morning dove goes off and you know, and the seagulls, oh they can't stand the seagulls either. They're after them all the time. So it's quite, a, it's, it's quite a, a, a theater if you, you know, people, people can bear to turn off their TVs and radios and connect to nature. It's just, uh, there's nothing better than bird song or wind in the trees to me. That's my music. I had them follow me home and, you know, kind of uh, go fly from one um group of wires to another as I walked home when I had a when I was using a white cane the reflectiveness of the material for the cane apparently yeah. interest it was freaky I mean obviously all I'm oh, about, maybe I that's why they were yelling at me to, yeah I knew <laughs> the, right. the birds the movie the birds and that I'm like yeah oh, yeah well I just tell them well, I have a also if you have a service dog so, okay. I have a question I, I have a, from Audubon Society wise. This is Marsha. Um, it used to be when I would go on bird watching with Audubon, they had this thing where you could take a picture on your cell phone or with your binocular camera or whatever, and then you, it automatically went on some website that they could tell exactly what it was, where it was found, and all that. 
how do you find that again? Wow. There, um, there's an app like that for um, <coughs> um, iBird, and uh, I don't know how automatic it is, but yeah, you can you can submit a photo. They can identify it, and iBird is a way to list your birds that will go into a giant database that's year that's uh, worldwide. Um, and it becomes part of the whole database uh, showing where the birds are and what they're doing. There's so a called bird. I, like the letter I or E-Y-E-I? -E yeah, it's, it's called iBird. I-B-I-R-D. Thank I you. Okay. iBird. Yeah, it's through Cornell University. What was the, what's the, That's there's it. a Thank bird you. up there in the Santa Barbara area that almost went now they it may end up being a bunch of them <laughs> that was almost extinct in the late 60s 70s and i can't think of the name of it and i heard they were coming back because they were protected and i wanted was wondering if did i say enough to help you to know what they i would know the name if i heard it and how they were doing in in reproducing. Couldn't tell you offhand. We have some people in Audubon who are way on top of it. Uh -huh. I know at one point the the brown pelican was very threatened. You wouldn't know it now, but it was um, it was very much endangered at one point, and the brown pelicans have made a good comeback. But that's been over the last couple of decades. So what about our, the Snowy Our methods plover. are working, huh? Say again? Our methods are working then. In they, we have methods that do work. I think the, the condor program has... That's it, the condors. That's yes. what I was just going to say. Oh, condor, okay. Yeah. Big bird, how could we miss that one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's getting to be a success story. The peregrine falcon is a, is a, a tremendous success story. Um, but that's nationwide. Uh -huh. uh, it was pretty much considered extinct east of the Mississippi. And wow. um, through the efforts of falconers and researchers and rehabbers and you know, several decades later, we have a very robust uh, population of peregrine falcons everywhere in North America. So that is an incredible success story. Um, Condor is still a little tenuous at this point. They still need a lot of human intervention to make sure they're going to survive in the wild. Uh, part of the problem is lead, um, trying to get the lead out of bullets, uh, you know, so that um, if people are hunting and the carcass is left behind and the condors go after it and they ingest the lead that's in the bullets and that's a, that's a problem. Um, you know, it's just, you know, if we put our minds to it, yes, we we can make a difference. Definitely. Definitely. And do you also know about the program from Audubon where you can make the barn owl um, like wood little, I guess they're, they're houses for them, but they give you the directions and you make them and people put them in certain parks to attract the uh, barn owls to have shelter or something. I used to do that and I can't find it anymore how you find sign up for that. Um, maybe uh, I can uh, help you with that off offline if you want to. Okay. Maybe through Brianna, um, we can do an email exchange, and I I can help you with that. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. I have a question, Connie. Um, it's Brianna. Do you guys at the Audubon Society work with the snowy plover um, restoration work? Um. Not directly. Um, there's a program. I'm trying to think who it's under. I think it's under UCSB. Um, they have a particular project out there because the snowy plovers are out kind of just um, north of the campus. And I'm trying to think of the name of the 
the department that's involved in that. So, but they have a program out there where they have docents and um, they do a lot of work out there trying to keep uh, plovers and everybody else kind of separated. <laughs> um, but so Audubon- Connie, I, I would guess that it's through the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity, CBER. That's, that's it, yes, yeah. yeah. So um, they've been having good success with that too. You know, it's just a matter of trying to make sure, you know, we all share the beach in a way that doesn't disrupt um, nature and, and yet humans can enjoy it too. So um, they've been very successful with that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Audubon's also doing a thing with um, uh, Western bluebirds uh, and tree swallows. We, we actually have boxes out for them and out near UCSB and at Lake Los Caneros um, and trying to encourage the bluebirds especially to reproduce because they, they're getting kind of taken over by the starlings. Starlings are kind of taking over the habitat that uh, bluebirds and swallows have used always. Yeah, they steal nests. And well, yeah, they're, they're taking the cavities opportunities that the other birds there's only so many cavity dwellings out there and oh. you know, a lot of competition and the starlings are more aggressive about it and yeah. they, they're they're non-native and <clears throat> pretty aggressive so anyway yeah again you know people are putting their minds to how they can help um you know help our our neighbors you know our wind neighbors out there I have I have a question about a different bird, but, and it's there's a lot of them around. What are the little tiny ones? Um, uh, uh, the, they they torpor. Uh, they're little. I have, in fact, I have a couple feeders for them. I I all of a sudden forgot the name of them. Um, I'm sorry. Hummingbird. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Um. If I see one in torpor on the on the ground, can I sh should I just leave it there? Or, um, or? If it's off the ground, that's kind of an unusual place for it to be. Uh, they go into torpor at night simply yeah. to to conserve their energy. I would say if, if there's a place higher up off the ground, it would probably be better. But um, it's kind of hard to know what's what's happening there. Why would it be on the ground at all? So well, it did. It you know it got warm the red you know warm enough the next day. The sun was on it in the morning and and it it did eventually wake up and fly off. Oh okay. And, and we'd seen it around. Well, I, we my neighbor, and we never knew if we should. We just she kept looking out and checking on it because we were afraid a cat would get it. Yeah. And so we didn't know what to what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I if I pick one up, I can if I can put it up high, you know, at least out of cat relative cat reach, it, it should be okay. It should be okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I'd say. Um, yeah. Just that's that's more the thing is uh, <coughs> dogs and and that. Yeah. Otherwise, They're, it's nature. I mean, if other things are going to get it, they, it's going to happen. Yeah. They're interesting because I heard them. I've heard them all my life, and I thought what I was hearing was an insect mm -hmm. kind of sound. That sound, and as it turned out, and thanks to my neighbor who had um, hummingbirds, and then we've got. A vegetable garden that we're doing for the second year and we have a feeder out there we've got four feeders around the yard and you know there's always competition for the different feeders and different groups of different hummingbirds <laughs> come around and and she my neighbor has taken videos of them because i hear them and she's done videos and sent them to me that that I can magnify and they there she has it slow motion 
okay. for me to watch them, which is really fun. Hi everyone, I have a question this is about Brianna. I just want to say it's three o'clock and I want to honor everyone's time. So um, before I end the recording, is there a, a website that you want to direct people to to check out more information on Audubon or Eyes in the Sky? What's the best website for that? Yeah, Hannah, you want to? Yeah, um, the best website for that is absolutely Santa Barbara Audubon Society. So let me pull that up. That's Santa Barbara Audubon Society dot org, which is I can spell it out if you want. S A N T A B A R B A R A A U D U B O N dot org. And I'm sure that'll be um, in the email as well and findable on the video. Perfect. Can you repeat it one more time? Is it just the name again? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Santa Barbara Audubon org and Audubon, which is a little tricky to spell, is a u d u b o n dot org. Dot, Thank you dot so org. much. Dot org. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connie and Hannah, for your time today and Bones. Thank you for your appearance, um, sharing your beauty, <laughs> beauty and your your calls with us. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks, ladies.